Greetings all, Last Outrider here, bringing you the next part of what is the Eye of Terror. This time we will focus upon the war in the web. His heart was beating a rapid tattoo within his chest, and Nyadian had to concentrate to contain his excitement. It was difficult to do so, this close to the Avatar's throne room and doubly so on the eve of battle. But it would not do to show such an unseemly display of emotion before his farseer. Eldran Ulthran had called him here to the Dome of Crystal Seers by name, and though he was intensely curious as to why, given that he was a warrior, not a seer, he was impatient to return to his training. Nyadian carried his helmet in the crook of his arm, the flexible wraithbone armor feeling natural against his body, and the spirits of its former wearers filling him with the urge to fight. Dimly, he remembered the moment he had forsaken the life of Nyadian the poet, to become Nyadian, the striking scorpion exarch. But that was a long time ago. And such thoughts were fleeting and ephemeral in the face of the prospect of battle against the forces of the ancient enemy. The wraith bone of the craft world pulsed with aggression and a thrumming current of barely suppressed violence saturated every Eldar within lust for battle. The Avatar was close to waking, and its dreams of violent bloodshed permeated every facet of Ulthway. The air sang with the promise of battle and Nyadian felt its call resonate in the very fiber of his being. <clears throat> the bloody-handed one calls to you, does he not, Nyadian? Said a soft voice behind him. He spun, hand involuntarily reaching for his sword, but relaxing as he saw the venerable false seer, Eldrad Ulthran made his way awkwardly through the softly glowing crystal trees of the dome, leaning heavily on his ornately carved staff. Nyadian saw that his flesh shone with a faint crystalline light, the skin translucent and unyielding. Nyadian nodded curtly. Yes. I can feel his heart burning in my veins. The call to war is one I cannot refuse. I know, said Eldred softly. It is your appointed path. And to deny that is to walk the road that has but one end. Eldred stopped beside the long and gracefully curved crystal tree, its structure veined with darting lights and the suggestion of a peaceful face swimming in its depths. These are dark times for our people, Nyadian, began Eldred. The one called the Despoiler readies his armies, and the Monkai do not heed my warnings. What has this to do with us, Lord Ulthran? growled Nyadian. If the Monkai wish to destroy themselves, let them! Ulthway is all that matters. The Farseer nodded. Normally, I would agree with you. But there are other forces at work here, Nyadian. The Silver Warriors of the Ignir have returned. 
the necroteer. After so long. Yes. They seek to destroy the remaining talismans of Val, and without them, we are helpless against the star gods. We should have taken them from the Monkai before they could lose them to the spoiler, said Nyadian, unable to contain the venom in his tone. True, agreed Aldran, but the jackal god's foresight stretches from the dawn of time and eclipses even mine. He isolated the Gothic sector. And we had not the strength to stop him. But there is worse, Nyadian. Ariman, the sorcerer of the Red Cyclops, has breached the webway. And he brings his soulless warriors in the power of ancient magics. Nyadian recoiled in horror at the thought of a minion of chaos within the sacred pathways of the Eldar. Such an affront could not be tolerated, and his warrior spirit burned with the fury at this upstart Monkai's temerity. He seeks the Black Library and the ancient knowledge it contains. He must not discover it for there are secrets it keeps that should never have been revealed, even to us. He will not discover it while I draw breath, assured Nyadian. My strike force is assembled, and our webway portal is prepared. We await only your order to depart. Send us to war. Lord Althran. In time, Nyadian, in time, soothed Aldred, staring wistfully at the crystal trees of his ancestors. Farseers stretching back to the time of the fall. The dark kin are also aware of the breach in the webway and mass for war. Their efforts to save the twilight city of Karag will be in vain, and the bloodshed they will unleash will only make things worse. There is one amongst them who thirsts for my death in particular, and he does not care that his actions will lead his people, as well as ours, to their doom. What would you have me do, Lord Ulthran? Aldrod turned and rested his hand upon the shoulder guard of Nydian's armor, feeling the lust for violence of all the exarchs who had worn the armor before Nydian, straining to be unleashed in battle once more. We must awake the avatar of Kayla Mincha Cain. Nydian. We will need his strength and fury for his presence to prevail in the coming war. I have seen many futures leading to this point, and in all of them, the Avatar walks among us. Nydian felt his heart swell with pride as he realized what must come next? This is why you have called me here? Eldred mournfully drawing a gnarled garland of wraith bones from a pouch at his waist. You have been chosen, Nydian. You are to be the young king. Hmm. <laughs> Leading up now to the 13th Crusade of Abaddon the Despoiler. 
As the plague known as the Curse of Unbelief swept through many imperial worlds throughout the Bellus Corona and Agrippina sectors, cults preaching that the Imperium had forsaken the teachings of the Emperor grew in number, decrying the sufferer's sickness as just a punishment for their wickedness. They claimed that only in the flames of purgation of pain could the cure be found, and they would provide both. On Malin's reach and Lethear, imperial rule had all but broken down, as the plague crippled the authorities' ability to contain the zealots and screaming demagogues who whipped the mobs into a frenzy of destruction and self-mutilation. Naval facilities and symbols of imperial rule were openly attacked, and over the following weeks, mob rule virtually replaced that of the administratum on many outlying worlds. Such vast outpourings of zeal and bloodshed echoed in the warp, stirring the already volatile immaterium into a new and violent life. The fringes of warp storm Baphomiel expanded to engulf the reaches of the Cadian system, and astropaths based at Kasser Partox reported terrible visions depicting vast plains of mutilated bodies and worlds burned with fire. Such incidences grew and spread throughout the sector until it was manifest in a horrifying manner on the world of Belshar in the choir chamber of astropaths high on the spire of Hive Teriox. During a routine autosense, the senior adept of astropaths began convulsing, his flesh blazing with psychic energy. Emergency warp dampeners and null shields dropped into place. But it was already too late, as uncontrollable energies burst through the material world and the top nine levels of the hive spire were instantly vaporized in a massive psychic explosion. The signs were unmistakable, and everything pointed towards a calamity of terrifying proportions. Readings of the Emperor's Tarot produced dire portents, and omens of fearful nature began appearing across the segmentum. Many of these proved to be false, but rumor and hearsay passed into fact and fear and paranoia, whipped entire populations into terrified, panicked hysteria. Members of the fraternist clergy, confessors, Preachers and cardinals were dispatched from the Synod Mysteria on Ophelia 7 to provide calm, spiritual, and authoritative guidance. But such was the widespread panic that their voices went largely unheard amidst the fear that gripped the imperial citizens. Almost lost among all the other incidences of terror and bloodshed, unknown raiders attacked the outlying agri-world of Dentor. The crew of a bulk freighter delivering agricultural machinery discovered this atrocity, finding entire communities butchered like livestock, and the landscape burned. Nothing was taken, and no motive could be ascertained. No more could be done, and the report was buried under the more pressing matters that continued to prey upon segmentum authorities. On Cadia itself, the adepts tasked with the study of the ancient pylons became aware of a new and unsettling development. 
The pylons, which had, until now, been utterly inert, began resonating with an almost imperceptible vibration. Research teams were immediately dispatched to investigate, and their findings were disturbing, to say the least. Microscopic stress fractures were developing along the previously impenetrable surfaces of the pylons, and all were resonating at an amplitude similar to that produced by a Geller field, the invisible energy field that shields a starship traveling through the warp. The pylons appeared to be fighting to hold back the power of warp storm Baphomet, but were slowly, but surely, destroying themselves in the process. What happens next, you ask? Well, you'll find out in the next part. Until then, bye.